Hey, this is Dr. Ben White, host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. I'm very excited to dive into the topic of genetically modified foods and glyphosate, which are topics I've been wanting to discuss for a while, but did not have the right guest. And now we'll be joined by the most prominent voice talking about the potential dangers of genetically modified organisms, Jeffrey M. Smith. Jeffrey is a global thought leader on the health dangers of genetically modified organisms for over 27 years. He's written two best-selling books, Seeds of Deception and Genetic Roulette. He's directed five documentaries, the most recent of which is Don't Let the Genie Out of the Bottle in 2021 and Secret Ingredients in 2018. Jeffrey has given thousands of lectures all around the world and has counseled world leaders on six different continents. He's the founder and CEO of the Institute of Reasonable Technology. Uh, Responsible technology. Uh, Oh, yeah. Institute of Responsible Technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, And he's now sounding the alarm, not only about GMOs and glyphosate, but about GMOs 2.0, which he'll explain. Genetically engineered foods have had their DNA changed using genes from other plants or animals. Scientists take the gene for a desired trait in one plant or animal, and they insert that gene into a cell of another plant or animal. Currently in the U.S., the main GMO crops are soybeans, corn, sugar beets, canola, and cotton. And there are currently two approved GMO animals, the Aqua Advantage Salmon and the Gal Safe Pig. Uh, Jeffrey? Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Great to be here. So um, how do you, what is your background and how did you get involved in this particular field? Well, I'm going to first say say that a number of times during our conversation, I'm going to talk about some short films that we did and things that people can do to take action. So right at the top, I'm going to give the URL so that people can go back and realize it's at the beginning. Absolutely. You have to find it in the middle. So responsibletechnology.org is the Mothership website. And if you do a slash take action, then you'll find out why I'm going to ask you to take action and what's there. And there's some films there. And there's some ways that we can prevent a, um, you know, apocalypse, things like that. All right. So what I want to, so you asked me the question, how I got into it. Yep. 27 years ago, I was in a lecture by a genetic engineer who's blowing the whistle on the technology. Monsanto was about to release it in our food supply officially. And the genetic engineer said, there is no way that Monsanto or any scientist on earth could predictably genetically engineer anything and put it in the food supply without possibly causing allergic reactions, toxins, nutritional problems. It's just no way. And in addition, once you release it outside, it'll cross-pollinate and you have no way to recall it. So you have just changed the gene pool forever. This technology is not ready for prime time and will not be any time in the seeable near future. So I decided to chip in a little and help with messaging and, and education and marketing and strategy, which is where I like to contribute. And 27 years later, and speaking in 45 countries and, you know, training 1,500 people to speak on it, I I contributed a little, and I continue to. (laughs) And we're going to talk not only about what you introduced in terms of GMOs and health and the environment, and also glyphosate, but GMO 2.0, and how that actually puts us at risk in a cataclysmic way. I mean, way beyond anything that I've been talking about for 25 years. And that's the subject of Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, which is at 16 minute film, which happens to be at responsibletechnology.org slash 
take action. Okay. And, and I I'm went ready. there and I watched it. <laughs> now I'm okay. Now <laughs> I am ready to go deep. And I'm, when I say deep, I mean when I when I'm speaking at a at a medical conference, for example, or even a, just a general health conference, and it's a breakout session, so you get to choose. A lot of people go, well, I know GMOs are bad. I don't need to go and hear about that. If I am in a keynote and everyone has to hear what I have to say, then it's like, OMG, I had no idea. <laughs> I thought I knew the dangers of GMOs. I thought I knew that they were bad, but I didn't know this bad. So we convinced tens of thousands of practitioners to prescribe organic diets. We've had tremendous, tremendous impact, but it's not like, oh yeah, GMOs, that's another thing that could go bad. It is, we're gonna look at some, some charts today that I'll describe for those that are listening just by audio. And it's gonna be like, I had no idea that switching to organic was the number one, the number one step for getting your health together. Not and, and a far distant from number two. I mean, you're, we're going to talk about all these very popular diseases that everyone's getting and talking about and how they may be directly linked to your consumption of GMOs and the glyphosate, which is the chief poison in Roundup, in your food. So we're going we're gonna, to like raise some eyebrows today for people that haven't heard this. So I, I just talked briefly about what genetically engineered foods are. Maybe you could put some more meat on those bones. Explain what genetically modified organisms are, why they were first developed. Sure. So first of all, you mentioned transferring genes from one species. That's the traditional way, but there's another GMO in town, and it's gene editing. And you don't have to be transferring genes from other species. They're still GMOs. But you're going in there and you're knocking out genes or cutting the the uh, genome in a place or two and hoping that when the thing gets reattached, it either adds what you want in or leaves out what you want and doesn't bring anything in extra that you don't want. So there's a lot of wishful thinking. And another film, which is just six minutes, called Seven Reasons Why Gene Editing is Dangerous and Unpredictable, is also at that one page responsibletechnology.org slash take action. Because right now, just as an FYI, the biotech industry was licking its wounds because we have been so successful for these 25 years, convincing and explaining to consumers why this stuff was not safe. And to doctors, to consumers, and <clears throat> people realized half the world's population realized that GMO foods were not safe. And the, it contained to about 12 genetically engineered food crops, as opposed to Monsanto's stated goal by this time to have 100% of all commercial seeds genetically engineered and patented. And so we've been able to keep it that way through education. So they come along and say, okay, squirrel, look the other way. We are <laughs> using gene editing, but it's not GMOs. It's not, in fact, we don't use any foreign genes. We put it in there and it's safe. It's predictable. It's even natural. In fact, it's just what nature would do automatically, only we do it better. And so this concept that gene editing should get a pass has been the subject of a multi-million dollar gang up lo lobbying campaign that convinced the American government, the British government, the UK, convinced Japan, convinced India, Australia convinced Brazil, Argentina, they're trying to create that same situation in the EU. So all of the incredible benefits and successes that we've had over 25 years are at risk because, now here's an interesting thing, Ben. It used to take so long to genetically engineer and, and expensive and a lot of expertise. You can buy a gene editing kit for $2,000 and create your own GMO every day. And we've given the keys to the kingdoms to virtually everyone. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I, I heard you say that. I'm still in shock over that pause. I can't believe that that's legal. How is that legal? Because of lies. I mean, if you go back, all right, we're going to go back to the original GMO 1.0. Okay, how is it that something which, and I'm going to explain how it's related to so many diseases that, I mean, all the major diseases, how it's possible that they could have allowed that on the market? Same question you asked just now. 
It turns out Monsanto convinced the White House, they had a lot of friends there, that GMOs were, were going to increase U.S. exports and domination by the U.S. in world food trade. So the White House told the regulatory agencies, allow GMOs on the market very, very quickly. And in fact, here, what you're supposed to do, FDA, is bring in this man called Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, who had the plan. So Michael Taylor was when well, they created a new position for him. They never had a position of the deputy commissioner of policy. They created it for Michael Taylor. And when he was in charge, he was to create the GMO policy. He also created the FDA policy on Monsanto's bovine growth hormone. So he created basically, you know, Fox in the chicken house. And the policy that the FDA created that's still good today, or still bad today, is that the agency isn't aware of any information showing that GMOs are different than non-GMOs. Therefore, no testing is necessary. No labeling is necessary. And companies like Monsanto can put GMOs on the market without even telling the FDA. If they do tell the FDA, there's a meaningless exercise at the end of which the FDA writes a letter and, and reminds them it's your job to determine if your foods are safe, not ours. So that is the policy created by Michael Taylor based on that sentence saying we know no difference. That was all a fraud. We realized that the policy came out in May 1992. And in 1998, my friend Steve Drucker pioneered a lawsuit against the FDA. They were forced to turn over 44,000 secret internal memos. And then we realized that the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the agency was exactly the opposite. The GMOs were different, were dangerous, needed to be tested, and should never have been approved. And their predictions came true. Their predictions that, in fact, its stuff is very dangerous and that people will just have the expectation that it's been done a thousand times before, so no one really needs to test it. And that's all the current situation. So we have gathered all the evidence that we could, and it's like a smoking shotgun of evidence showing that GMOs and the Roundup sprayed on them, and I'll explain that in just a minute, are probably driving tremendous number of diseases in the United States. And we know that when people switch to organic, which doesn't allow either, they get better from the same type of diseases. Yeah, I went to the FDA website. This is what the FDA website states. <clears throat> GMO foods are carefully studied before they are sold to the public to ensure they are as safe as the foods we currently eat. These studies show that GMOs do not affect you differently than non-GMO foods. Further, the FDA website says GMO foods are as healthful and safe to eat as their non-GMO counterparts. Some GMO plants have actually been modified to improve their nutritional value. An example is GMO soybeans with healthier oils that be can be used to replace oils that contain trans fats. Since GMO foods were introduced in the 90s, research has shown that they are just as safe as non-GMO foods. Additionally, research shows that GMO plants fed to farm animals are as safe as non-GMO animal food. <laughs> this, is, this is basically <laughs> fiction. This is a fictional story. <laughs> Chapter one, once upon a time, <laughs> let me tell you what the what the actual FDA scientists said that we have the memos. OK, it says this was from Linda Call, the compliance officer, summarizing the experience of the 17 scientists that were handpicked to create the policy on GMOs, which was overruled by Michael Taylor. She said the process of genetic engineering is different than conventional breeding and leads to different risks. According to the technical experts at the agency, leads to different risks. The, by trying to say that it's the same is forcing a square peg into a round hole. Then Lewis Pribble, a microbiologist from FDA, when he got back the latest version from Michael Taylor, said, what's become of this document? It's basically a pro-industry document that doesn't address any of the side effects. It's what do I have to do to stay out of trouble type document. And then the, the toxicological evaluation, the head of the toxicological uh, department said that it's justified to have at least a partial toxical, human toxicological studies on every GMO. The, the uh, Charles Guest, who is the um, head of the, divi the Division of Veterinary Medicine, said the milk and meat from animals fed GMOs is different and could lead and 
can have specific unique risks, talking about bioaccumulation to things and like that. They were very specific. What happened was even this completely sanitized pro-GMO version written by Michael Taylor, ignoring all the science, was sent up to the White House, the Office of Management and Budget and the White House Council and uh, another, another person came back and said, no, 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 it raises too many issues. It has too many pages de dedicated to the environmental issues. We should emphasize that GMOs are safer. And so, and so as it went up the, the political chain of command, GMOs got safer and safer <laughs> until we end up with this complete, absolute <laughs> moronic fiction. And, and I mean, I can give you some examples that are, that, I mean, when I speak to medical conferences, I'll start off at the, at the beginning and say, okay, uh, or any conference, you know, tell me what, what percentage of organic foods you eat, how many zero to 20, 20 to 40, and I get a ch chance to see everyone's hands up. Then for the, for the practitioners, I say, how many of you prescribe organic diets? And very few people usually raise their hand. So at the end of 40 minutes of pictures of rat tumors and this thing and that thing and epidemiological evidence and plausible uh, causative pathways between GMOs, Roundup, and different diseases, I say, and now, what percentage of your diet will be organic going forward? Zero to 20? No one raises a hand. 20 to 40? Everyone's like up at 60 to 100%. And, you know, how many of you will prescribe organic diets? All the hands go up. And, and I went back to some conferences where the doctors had actually started prescribing organic diets. And they said, it worked. Our patients got better. And, and I went to their offices, interviewed the patients, and it worked. Went to the farmers who took their pigs and cows off of GMOs, and they their animals got better. And I looked at veterinarians, both in terms of livestock and in terms of pets, and we also have the animal feeding study. So we have a bunch of diseases, which I'm happy to introduce at any, any time, that we think are related to GMOs and Roundup. And we have a bunch of, of ind individual reports and, and clinical trials, clinical experience of people getting better uh, from these same diseases or their precursors. We have the animal feeding studies and the experience of, of the vets and the doctors. So I can describe why we think GMOs and Roundup are driving diseases like nothing else. And the main thing is switch to organic. Right. So let's go into that. And, and uh, uh, my understanding is a lot of these genetically modified foods are like the corn and the soy are genetically modified to be resistant to Roundup. So then they can just indiscriminately spray this herbicide all over the food. Yeah, let me explain that. And it was a well, well, well described. Roundup kills virtually all the plants, right? It also kills a lot of microbes. It's an antibiotic. And if you were to spray it over your field of soybeans or corn, normally you'd kill it all. So you have to spray it before the emergence of the crop or just spot spray it on weeds. But Monsanto's patent on glyphosate, which was the chief poison in Roundup, was going off in 2000, and they wanted to maintain sales. So they genetically engineered seeds, soy and corn, then cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa, to, not, to create plants that would withstand and not die when sprayed with Roundup. So they call them Roundup Ready. So the Roundup Ready soy, as a farmer, you buy the seeds, you sign a contract. I'll only use Monsanto's glyphosate-based herbicide. So they ended up continuing their domination of glyphosate, even though it's off patent. And now the farmers can weed really easily. They can weed after their crops are growing and then new weeds come up and they just spray right over the top. One application, two applications, three applications. Now, glyphosate by itself is not as toxic as Roundup because Roundup has all sorts of other things, including a surfactant that drives it into the tissues of the plants. Now, it also drives it into human skin. It also can, you know, drive it through clothes, even through boots. In fact, Monsanto was required to turn over evidence of how much absorption into human skin was taking place. So they took the human cadaver skin 
and they put Roundup on it, and they found it was th over three times the allowable level of absorption. So they threw that information away, hid it illegally from the EPA, and then they decided to do a Monsanto version of a, of a study. I love how Monsanto science is. This is typical. This is typical, Ben. They took human Monsanto, they took, Monsanto took human skin from a cadaver and baked it in an oven. Now, you know what happens when you bake meat? It gets harder and harder and harder. That wasn't good enough. They probably tried it. It wasn't good enough. They took this baked, overcooked human skin, and then they froze it. Wow. Then they took this leather-like result of human skin and applied Roundup. And there was hardly any absorbed. So they reported those numbers to the EPA, omitting that, I don't know, that inappropriate fact that they had baked and frozen human skin before they applied the Roundup. That was hidden. They never mentioned that. There was no asterisk, by the way, this has no resemblance to human skin. So this is a Monsanto type study. So so it would have it potentially would not have even gotten approved if they oh no, had. oh no. There's yeah. so many ways that they manipulated data that would never none of this stuff would have gotten approved. So now you spray it over the the crop and it drives the the glyphosate poison into the soybean plant. And then it gets 15% or so leaf through the roots, damaging the crop, damaging the soil below, and about 80-85% that stay in the plant, mostly in the food. Now, we eat that food. Now, glyphosate is no friend to the human body. Now, you're, you're a physician, and I'm going to describe some of the things that glyphosate does, and you're realizing that I'm actually checking off a checklist of the foundations of health. And that any one of these could lead to many diseases, if not a vast number. Glyphosate was originally patented as a chelator to descale industrial boilers and pipes. So it grabs onto minerals and doesn't let go. So the first thing it is, is it deprives our body of minerals. Second, it creates leaky gut. Third, it kills off beneficial gut bacteria, but not the nasty stuff. Four, it can block the production of serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine. Next, it can damage our aromatase, which sets the balance between the estrogen and testosterone. It can damage and collapse the structure of mitochondria, which are the energy centers in our bodies. It can cause a gap, the gap junctions, which is the way cells inter, uh, intercommunicate. It knocks that out by 50%. It blocks the detoxification pathways of the body, both the NRF2 going down 30% and the P450 the P450 cytochrome uh, pathway uh, SIPE enzymes that operate in the in the um, the liver. Okay. It causes damage to the to the um, microvilli in the intestines. It blocks the production of not completely, but it suppresses the production of enzymatic, of enzymes in the gut to break down food. And it causes birth defects, oxidative stress, and genotoxicity, and is declared a, a class two carcinogen by the WHO. All right? Wow. Now that's like, you name a foundation of health, and it's taken care of by this Darth Vader chemical. It just it is just slashed and burned. So now, when you're spraying soybeans or corn, Roundup Ready corn, with Roundup, and you feed it to rats, and like Monsanto did, and there was fifty statistically significant changes that they said, oh, they're not problem, and that was only ninety days, and they sent it to Europe, and this guy Serolini, who was reviewing for France, said. This is a lot of problems. And these show preliminary evidence of damage to liver and kidneys and preliminary evidence of a lot of things. But they cut the study off in 90 days and they didn't do all the tests that they should have done to see if these things were serious. In fact, they did pretty superficial studies. So he took the same type of rats, the same rat size group, the same amount of GMOs in the food supply sprayed by Roundup and fed them for two years. And they had multiple massive tumors. The tumors started 
and 120 days, like right after they finished the 90 days, the next, the first tumor started. So they had multiple massive tumors. Some of them were like 25% of the body weight. They killed the animals because it was considered suffering after that point. They had organ damage and they died early. Now, was it the corn, the Roundup Ready corn or the Roundup? They figured out before they even started to have more than one experimental group. So one group were fed the Roundup Ready corn sprayed with Roundup. Another group was the Roundup Ready corn that was never sprayed with Roundup. And a third group, actually many groups, had just Roundup at varying levels in the drinking water eating natural corn. And then they had a control. So it turns out all of the groups had multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage, whether it was the Roundup alone, the GMO alone, or the two together. The only group that didn't was the control group. So we understand more about how Roundup does the killing and whatnot, because there's more research on it, all those things I just described. For GMOs, because the FDA said we don't need any testing, there's just a handful of studies, but that handful of studies show potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, damaged immune system, changes in virtually every organ and every system studied. So we have an idea. So what I'd like to do, Ben, with your permission, is walk us through some of the evidence. Absolutely. All right. Please do. So I'm going to share a screen in just a moment, and this is an this is a, a amount of, of Roundup sprayed on soy and corn in the United States in a graph showing the slope and other slides that I'm going to show. It's both the amount of Roundup sprayed on there and also the what percentage of GMO soy and corn there are, because it's basically the same. You only spray Roundup on soy and corn if it's GMO you know, at least the, the volume that we're talking about. And I, I just want to say to all the listeners, anybody who's listening to this on your phone, when you get home, go to YouTube and watch the YouTube video and go to my White's Cairo page and you can see the, um, the slides. And these are plotted against rises in specific diseases. And so for those who are not going to see, and I haven't started showing it yet, the, rise, the, the correlation is pretty tight. A perfect correlation is one. These correlations are like 0.9. I'm looking at one like 0 0.93, 0 0.97, 0 0.96. It's like it looks like the two are sloping up together. All right, so let me share my screen. Um, what we're seeing first is inflammatory bowel disease. And you could see this is the discharge rate per 1,000. Now, I'm going to go through a lot of charts very, very quickly, and I'm going to name the disease, and you can just look at the slope. And for those that are not looking, I'm just going to name the disease. And those, your friends watching, are their jaws are dropping, going, OMG, just acknowledge that these things do look like they're related. Here's deaths from obesity, anxiety, diabetes, deaths from Alzheimer's deaths from Parkinson's, deaths from high blood pressure, autism in six-year-olds, insomnia, celiac disease, acute kidney injury, death from kidney failure, kidney and pelvic cancer, liver cancer, liver and bile duct cancer, thyroid cancer, deaths from acute myeloid leukemia, breast cancer, Deaths from intestinal infection, deaths from disorders of lipoprotein metabolism, peritonitis, hepatitis C, dementia, deaths from senile dementia, ADHD, schizophrenia, suicide by overdose, birth defects, and there's a lot of birth defects here, heart defects, newborn metabolic disorders, newborn genital urinary disorders, skin disorders, newborns with lung conditions, eye, dis eye disorders, blood disorders, plus general, general audience anemia, lymph disorders, deaths due to stroke. And in this final slide, and I'm gonna come back to this in just a minute because I wanna, I wanna introduce this. So first of all, all of those charts 
are devastating, but they don't prove causation. You can run two things together and say, hey, see, A causes B. But you can't tell that A causes B. Right. So you need other information. So you don't, if we just had that, it would be kind of weak evidence. It would be stunning in its coincidence and its correlation. But you can look at those particular disorders and we can find supporting evidence from animal feeding studies showing often the precursors to those when animals are fed GMOs and Roundup. You can find plausible causative pathways. What is it about GMOs around it that are causing that? For example, you saw insomnia. Insomnia is often governed by the amount of melatonin you have. Melatonin comes from the amount of serotonin available. Serotonin is created by L-tryptophan, which is produced by your gut bacteria in a metabolic pathway called the shikimate pathway. The shikimate pathway is disabled by glyphosate. Right. Right. Straight line. Straight line. And if you don't have enough sh- uh, serotonin, that could explain the some of the ADHD and the anxiety and all that stuff. When we talk about um, digestive problems, there's probably 40 or 50 things influencing that. And speaking of digestive problems, so in 2009, I went to the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and I've been speaking there every year. The GMOs and Roundup influence on different diseases. Each year, they focus on a different disease allergies, cancer, this thing. And I was just basically putting all the evidence together showing, is it possible that GMOs and Roundup might affect those diseases? And sure enough, there was a lot of evidence. So a lot of these doctors started prescribing non-GMO diets, and they're the ones that first told me this was influencing people. And before then, I was, I'm embarrassed to say, I didn't really believe people when they came and said, you know, I can tell if I notice, I can notice if I'm eating GMOs or not. But these doctors are saying, oh, no, it's quick. In fact, this one doctor, Dr. Emily Lindner, had put 5,000 patients on non-GMO diets and said, yeah, allergy, I mean, um, anxiety and depression goes away kind of right away, asthma and allergies three to seven days, digestive disorders within about two months, and then you have to rebuild it, so it makes me two years for the digestive. I was like blown away, and I interviewed some of her patients. So I started getting bold, and around 2012, when I came out with Genetic Roulette, I started asking audiences, okay, how many of you um, who are in the 60 to 100% non-GMO, how many people noticed changes in your health? A bunch of hands went up, almost everyone in that category. All right, what, what did you notice? People would tell me, oh, I got acid reflux that went away or, or a less weight or you know, kidney disease. And I'd always say, all right, who else noticed a change in this area? And I'd get a sense of the number of hands. And in 150 lectures, including about two dozen medical conferences, where they were referring to their entire practices results, the number one result was always digestive disorders. The number two was always the combination, I'd say, increased energy and reduced brain fog, always number two. Then there was, it was about 28 different conditions that I tracked. So I wrote it up in a survey and sent it out to, at the Institute for Responsible Technology, we have subscribers, and 3,258 people responded. And this particular um, screen that I'm now to share is the summary of what we found in those 28 different conditions. 85% reported improvement in digestive problems. This was peer-reviewed and published in the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. 60% said reduced fatigue. 55 reduced obesity. 52 reduced brain fog. 52 reduced anxiety and depression. 50 food allergies and sensitivity. And then below 50% going down to just 1.4, you have memory and concentration at 48, joint pain, seasonal allergies, gluten sensitivity, insomnia, skin conditions other than eczema, hormonal problems, muscular skeletal pain, autoimmune disease, eczema, high blood pressure, asthma, menstrual problems, diabetes, uh, mental disorders other than anxiety and depression, underweight, cancer, kidney disease, infertility, autism, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. So it's interesting that many of these are the same ones or similar to the ones that are on the rise in the U.S. population. Now, that's basically the general population that eat more than their body weight in GMOs every year, going up with the increased use of GMOs and Roundup in the United States. These are people who opt out of that experiment and get better from many of these same disorders. And then we have veterinarians like Barbara Royal, who's Oprah's vet. She said when she went to college, to veterinary school, they didn't even talk about dog cancers or dog allergies. Now it's all over the place. 
One out of every 1.6 dogs have cancer, I'm told. And she said, I got a sense that maybe it's the food and the GMOs and the Roundup. So very tentatively and kind of scared, I would, I put the animals on a, a organic diet. And now everyone goes on an organic diet, or at least in a diet that doesn't have GMOs and Roundup. And she said, 80 to 90% are all managed by the next visit. They don't even need anything. 40% completely healed. And so what I'm saying is, if, if people don't know whether what they're experiencing, and then they may have been part of this disease list, maybe they're not. If you switch to organic, you may be fixated on, oh, I want to lose weight, or I got diabetes, so I'm going to check my, my, blood, my blood sugar, or I'm going to check uh, insomnia. You may be focused on one thing. I suggest that you focus on everything by taking notes. Get a spreadsheet and on start with what percentage of your diet is organic. Start today, zero or whatever it is. Put your energy level, your mood, one to 10, and all your symptoms, the date. Then the next day, percentage organic, everything, right? Move right along. Three or four weeks, see what happens. And see, and some people will notice that if they go on vacation and they cheat, they go out to eat all those things go back. If in, my, in the movie I did with Amy Hart, Secret Ingredients, these doctors say they got excited when their patients cheat because then their autoimmune disease symptoms come back, their joint pain comes back, and then they don't cheat again because they realize that was the reason. And so you don't have to get to that level. You can just do it and see what happens. And I would say that is one experiment where it, the payoff is huge. And um, not only when you consume these genetically modified uh, organisms, uh, corn, soy, et cetera, but they spray Roundup on a lot of crops just to dry it out before we eat it. Exactly. And so that's why, Ben, I used to say to people, eat non-GMO, and if you can, eat organic because you'll avoid the other poisons. Now I say eat organic, and if you can't, at least eat non-GMO but also avoid the foods that are sprayed with Roundup heavily that are not GMO. So let me unpack this. So I think it was about 2006, Monsanto was looking to sell Roundup based, you know, their Roundup herbicides to other farmers. So they said, okay, wheat farmers, spray your wheat three to five days before harvest. Now, guys, we're, we're spraying something that's going to kill your wheat, but it's going to kill it slowly and it's first going to dry it down. So when you dry it down, it actually helps in terms of not getting moldy, but also the, the plants start to die and they say, save our kids, send all the energy to the kids, which is the grain. And so it forces the ripening of the grain. So it fast paces the ripening, it dries down the uh, harvest, it kills all the weeds for next year. It's called staging. And then you just harvest it and feed it to people with a massive amount of glyphosate in the wheat. Wow. So right now, wheat is not GMO, except there's a crop that came out of Argentina last year. And so don't eat Argentinian wheat unless you know it's organic and non-GMO. But in other cases, it's not been GMO, but it often is sprayed with Roundup. One of the worst is oats because it's like a sponge. Then you have the lentils and the mung beans and the chickpeas. Don't, don't eat hummus unless it's organic. You see, organic does not allow either GMOs or Roundup to be used. So that's why I keep emphasizing organic. If we just said non-GMO, you'd still be having bread and oatmeal and, and hummus and things like that. They could be loaded with, with Roundup. And if you go Organic, you also avoid other things like atrazine and all these other nasties. And I did a little research, and not only is there glyphosate, but there's also heavy metals like uh, arsenic present in Roundup. Oh, yeah. I mean, and like the surfactant is about a thousand times or maybe 10,000 times more toxic than glyphosate alone. Some of these other um, uh, co ingredients are. are our hormone disruptors and are toxic. Yeah, it's pretty nasty stuff. And I mean, 
The impact of glyphosate alone, though, cannot be understated. Um, they had parts per trillion that caused non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in rats. And this was the most sophisticated research showing that it was causal. Not like it suggests, but glyphosate causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And at tiny amounts, so tiny, in fact, that if you, if you calculate the amount per body weight of these rats per day, the EPA allows 437,000 times that amount in our food, in our water supply. Wow. And so we're eating, we're eating it. And now 30, 40, 30, 35% of the U S population has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and they have glyphosate in their urine. And those that have the worst version of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease have more glyphosate in their urine. That's another study. Wow. And we're, we're expecting Americans to have a tsunami of liver failure as a result of this increase in the non-alcoholic fatty liver. Absolutely. And, and you know, liver cancer, cirrhosis, all that stuff. There, it's, it's a pretty remarkable um, world that I live in because I hear maybe more than anyone, people with such a variety of diseases and disorders coming to me saying, guess what happened to my whatever, you know, my, my restless leg syndrome right. went away. I've heard that. And it was like, you know, someone says there's, there's a, I can tell there's a change in my urine. Just when I ate a GMO, I could see the, the bubbles in the, it's like, it was the veterinarian could see the difference in his, in, in, in the processing of his kidneys when he eats a GMO or not and instantly. So, yeah, I mean, I've heard this from so many people. And I would say, you don't have to understand the details. In fact, I don't go slow enough in an hour long conversation with you so that people can rationally expect to understand all the details. If they understand the patterns and they see the causative, the plausible causative pathways between, you know, the shikimate pathway and the neurotransmitters, and they see the pathway between uh, the, the genotoxicity and the oxidative stress and the, and the leaky gut and the uh, gap junctions and cancer. Those, all those are cancers, cancer causing. And you see, and we know, for example, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is deeply connected and that's from the bone marrow and that's where the glyphosate residues end up, right? And hang out there for a long time. So we can break it down. And so what I, my main point is, I'm not trying to give people the ability to give a talk on it. I do do that and it's, <laughs> it takes eight hours <laughs> to really understand it all. I just am wanting to give people enough information to go, oh my God, did you hear that? We have to ch make a change in our diet. And if you, f and you know, the number one convincer is the movie Secret Ingredients at secretingredientsfilm.com. That will, that shows people who are on the spectrum or no longer on the spectrum, who are infertile, who, no, who, who now have kids, who were overweight, who had brain fog, who had allergies, and they transitioned out and they went, it was organic, A to B, boom. And, uh, you know, I learned from your website that I remember back in the 80s when the FDA took tryptophan off the market and it's still off the market. And that was actually a result of genetically modified the way they produce the tryptophan. Well, it is back on the market, but here's an interesting thing. So the FDA, if you look at the, at the documents that were made public because of that investigation, they were trying to promote pharmaceutical drugs and try to suppress the sales of competing herbs and amino acids and other things. So they were wanting to get tryptophan off the market, but they couldn't. Then along comes a genetically engineered variety from a company called Showadenko KK out of Japan that caused about five to 10,000 people to fall sick and about 100 people died from this horrible disease. And it was only that company's brand that was causing the disease. And only that company was genetically engineering the bacteria that was producing the tryptophan. So what did the FDA do? They blamed it on all tryptophan. Right. Then when they testified before Congress, they never mentioned that it was a, genetic engineering was involved. 
And they then, tryptophan was used for calming, right? You know, and, 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 and insomnia. That was taken off the market. Then comes Prozac, or uh, I think that was the thing that came in at that time. Yeah. And, you know, sales come up heavily. And, you know, the FDA took it off the market saying, oh, that was causing the problem. They didn't even take it out of baby formula or, or IVs. It's like, it was like, if it's going to really cause problems, you got to really take it off the market. So it was even a bad cover up. They never <laughs> got the, they never got the strains and brought them over to the U.S. to see because there was five to six contaminants that were found that were between 0.1 and 0.01 percent. And I mean, we we looked at that. In fact, one of my friends who passed away, Bill Chris, was the chief investigator for years and turned over all of his notes to me before he died. And I published that in my book, Seeds of Deception, and then summarized it in, in Genetic Roulette. And what's interesting here, Ben, and I do want to jump to the GMO 2.0 before we run out of time. Yes. But what's interesting is the only, it was causing an epidemic, right? And it was an epidemic with five to 10,000 falling sick. And the only reason that it was discovered was because the disease had three simultaneous characteristics. It was fast acting, it was acute, and it was rare. Now, if any of those things were not in place, if it was not fast acting, if it took months to show up, no one would link it to a food supplement on the market. If it was not rare, if someone just got more colds or, or, or something, kidney disease, something that's already out there, they would just treat it. People don't say, what are you, what supplements are you taking? They don't pay attention. So, and if it was, so it was acute and it was serious. So it forced people to go to the hospital or to doctors. And this had all three. It was an absolute disastrous disease that caused paralysis, that progressed, that pain that was off the charts. And no one had ever seen it before. And it was still almost missed because no one was talking about it in the literature. It just happened to be that one doctor had two patients with it. That coincidence, they checked everything they were taking. There was one thing that both were taking, and that was L-tryptophan. In fact, if one of them had an L-tryptophan uh, from a different uh, company, they wouldn't have gotten sick. But anyway, that was what caused the investigation to identify it. So that means that the foods that are on the market, the GMOs and whatnot, may be causing diseases and have been just as was the predicted or concerned by the FDA scientists, massive diseases. All this whole list of diseases could be going up because of GMOs and Roundup, but it's not fast acting, acute and rare. These are common diseases that are happening. And so it's not that it's easy to figure out the cause when it's a food. Because when you go to the doctor and say I have cancer, they don't say, oh my God, what have you been eating? Right. They don't look for that. It has, there's a certain set of circumstances that will then cause an investigation and then research and then additional research. There's a certain way that it becomes epidemiologically identified. But if it's simply in the food supply, it can be missed forever. So the main takeaway is that the, of this L-tryptophan, is that that demonstrated that genetic engineering might cause serious diseases and that they can be missed. And, you know, when I, I, I've been preaching organic for years and people say, well, can I really trust organic? My answer is usually, look, it's, I, I'm sure it's not perfect, but it's going to be a lot better. I would say that is an excellent, excellent answer. There is occasional fraud. But if you look, if you go to responsibletechnology.org, you can actually see a glyphosate residue report. The FDA tests all the glyphosate, I mean, all the insecticide and herbicide residues on foods except for glyphosate, because their friends in Monsanto convinced them that it was harmless. So we have to basically take our studies and other NGO studies, nonprofit studies. We put them all together in one database, go to our site, and you can look at all the, at the foods. Those that are organic are almost always very slight amounts of glyphosate or non-detectable. Now, why would it be slight? Because there's so much glyphosate being sprayed. It's in the air. <laughs> it's in the water. It's in the rain. Wow. The U.S. Geological Survey found glyphosate in 60 to 100 percent 
of the air samples and rain samples in the Midwest. In Mississippi, it was 75%. Wow. So you can't avoid it completely, but you want to minimize it. Very, very scary. So let's go into uh, GMO 2.0. All right. So now I think we have, oh, we have given a, a problem and we've given a solution. And the solution is eating organic. And this has been the focus of our institute to get consumers to realize. And, and also try to contribute and lobby to uh, oh, yeah. have genetically modified foods taken off the market and be labeled, et cetera. Right. That's in addition. But for those listening, the first thing is protect yourself and your family. Right. And if you have energy left over and time and money, contribute to the cause, et cetera. So that was sort of the messaging for 25 years. And then um, along comes GMO 2.0, and it gives a, it's given a free pass by all these governments. And one of the examples of 2.0 is gene editing. We've heard of CRISPR. Now, CRISPR right. may ultimately be useful for clearing off a defective gene for someone that has a genetic disorder. It, it has all these side effects, so much so that the prominent journal Nature called the side effects chromosomal mayhem, I mean, massive damage, and they're going to try and fix it, and maybe they will. And I'm not against the use of this when it's applied to an individual with consent who's aware of the dangers, and sometimes human gene therapy does work, and sometimes it kills people. But we're now using the same accident-prone technology. The most common result of genetic engineering is surprise side effects, and we're putting it into the food supply. And we're putting organisms into the environment where they cannot be recalled. And now gene editing is so cheap. It's like a gene rush, Ben. We know what a gold rush is. You have all these people going out in a Wild West scenario. Now we have all these individuals, companies, students, well-wishers wanting to genetically engineer things to patent them and to solve problems of nature. And the thing is, if you multiply all of this enthusiasm into actually giving people these kits and these labs, and you give them the keys to the kingdoms, and they change the, the gene pool, then eventually, maybe this generation, we will have fully corrupted gene, nature's gene pool, replace nature, and no future generation can inherit the products of the billions of years of evolution. But instead, a hybrid somewhere between nature and man-made constructions. Now, this is a potential catastrophe. Yeah, very, very scary. And of all of the organisms that you can genetically engineer, I'm going to ask you a question. Which do you think are the most dangerous? Uh, well, I don't see what could go wrong if we were to, like, modify the DNA of a virus, you know? Yeah, why not? <laughs> all right. So let's make it an even a broader class. Let's talk about <laughs> microbes. So we take microbes, right? You know, and many of your listeners know, they hear the word microbiome and they go, oh, that's important. That's the thing. That's the that's the that's the in thing now. Right. We're discovering after, you know, the millennia of our history that these this micro Jedi army inside us is largely responsible for the state of our health, whether we're fat or skinny, even some of our desires, our moods. 80% of diseases, I'm told by my friend Kieran Christian, who's an expert, comes from changes in the microbiome. And it turns out Roundup kills off beneficial stuff in the <laughs> microbiome in such a way that I went through these same 28 different conditions with Karen Christian. I said, can the changes that you saw in the human gut from, from Roundup <clears throat> explain any of these? All of them, all 28 of them. So now we realize the microbiome is mission critical for humans. When there's less microbes in the brain, when we reduce them, IQ goes down, according to my friend Dietrich Klinghardt. Now, the microbes in the soil sequester carbon, promote health, create nutrient density. Algae is a microbe. It produces 70% of the Earth's oxygen. That's a lot. The, the <laughs> fungi in the soil shuttles nutrients <clears throat> between trees <clears throat> and allows the small trees that don't have sunlight to grow because the, the mother trees give them the nutrients. How? Through their friends, the fungi, which are microbes. The microbes are amazing. Now, that they have co-evolved with us so much that we actually have a situation where in the second trimester of humans, milk digesting 
bacteria move into the birth canal to inoculate the newborn, and, the, and then a lot of the milk that comes from the mother is indigestible by the infant. It's designed to feed the microbes. And the health of the baby is reflected in the saliva, salivary microbes, which feed back through the breast to the mother, which change the formula. I mean, it is so important that these nuanced changes are mind-blowing, and I haven't even gotten into some of the details. So this coevolution is such that we have outsourced 90% of our everyday metabolic and chemical functions to these critters. We can get away with a measly 23,000 genes, less than earthworms, because we use the <laughs> genetic information of 3.5 million genes in the microbes living inside us. And there's 10 times more than, actually more than 10 times compared to the cells inside our body. Now along comes a high school student a high school student who has a CRISPR lab in his biology class. And he can order from 10,000 different microbes online or 120,000 different targeted gene sequences to tell the CRISPR where to cut, or he can order his own gene sequence, or he can pick up microbes from his own gut or his own poop, or he can take it out of the, out of the swamp near his house. Then he can CRISPR it and then take it for a walk. Wow. Now, let's suppose it survives, lives long and multiply, you know, thrives, multiplies. First of all, they replicate faster than cows. <laughs> they replicate very, very quickly. They travel. We know that. We didn't need a pandemic to know that microbes travel and mutate. Most people don't realize that microbes also exchange genes. They're very promiscuous. They share they're just bacterial sex. It's actually this flow of genetic information through the microbiome that allows the entire microbiome to adjust and adapt to support like, uh, ecosystems and to be supported by them. So you, the same random act of weirdness by a high school student now ends up in 10,000 different types of microbes in 100,000 different ecosystems, including inside human bodies, wow. making changes that were never part of the coevolution. Wow. causing possible human health issues or collapsing, collapsing ecosystems in the environment. Then you have companies like Bear Monsanto, Bear Bolt Monsanto, whose joint venture with Ginkgo Bioworks is creating nitrogen-fixing microbes for the soil. Now, there's many reasons why you don't want to release genetically engineered nitrogen-fixing microbes. Now, one is, I mean, what happens if it gets washed into the Mississippi, and then it transfers those nitrogen-fixing microbes into algae, and now you have algae that can produce its own dead zones. We don't know if that's a possibility, but we may end up with nitrogen-fixing microbes inside us. Or what about the, the survival mechanism built into those nitrogen-fixing microbes, which probably kill off other microbes and have antibiotic resistance so that they survive? That's like a tank. So you put the trait inside the tank. Now the tank gets transferred inside our gut bacteria, and now it's surrounding a pathogen, killing off other bacteria, resisting the death by antibiotics, and you've now changed the population of our pathogens in our gut because of this nitrogen-fixing microbe. Now, it gets worse. Wow. And if you go to, guess what that URL is? It's responsibletechnology.org slash take action. If you go to don't let the gene out of the bottle, as you saw, there's some well-meaning scientists that said, let's take a natural soil microbe that's on the roots of every plant on the planet and turn it into a alcohol production factory and give it to farmers so they can rake up their crop residues and put it in tanks with the genetically engineered bacteria and turn it into alcohol to run their tractors and put the nutrient-rich sludge on the bottom on their fields. Well, as you'll see, I'm not going to be a complete... Uh, plot spoiler, but according to a, a scientist involved, if it hadn't been stopped by research results of her graduate student, that seemingly well-meaning thing might have ended terrestrial plant life on planet Earth. Wow. I hate when that happens, but we don't know. <laughs> we don't know if it would have happened. We don't know if the other one mentioned in there would have altered weather patterns forever, but it's potentially there. So now I'm, what I'm talking about is if every high school has a CRISPR kit and all these 
um, college students use CRISPR and all these entrepreneurs and organizations use CRISPR and they're releasing these microbes in the environment, millions of varieties each year. What's going to happen to our nature? What's going to happen to our health? Wow. And right now on responsibletechnology.org slash take action, we have a response to the USDA's draft guidance on how to get a permit to genetically engineer microorganisms. And their take on what's considered to be safe is so 50-year-old science. Maybe, all right, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. 20-year-old science, maybe. And so they have a comment period, and I want to suggest that everyone go there and add your name to the comments so they see it's not just the Institute for Responsible Technology, but it's a uh, 1,000 of our closest personal friends or 10,000 of our closest personal friends. And we're going to send you also after that updates and other action ste steps because we have even bigger fish to fry because we're now starting a new global movement to protect the microbiome. We're going to have various opportunities for people to use their networks to support us, et cetera, I do strongly recommend that people make a recurring donation. For the healthcare practitioners who are listening, very shortly, maybe by the time you visit the site, we will have a healthcare practitioner program. So you support us and we give you all this information, train you how to speak, give information for your practitioners. You know, if you're a company, we have a way of getting information out to your customers. You can be part of work. We have all sorts of things we're working on now and we're just held back right now by the amount of staff we can afford. So we need a little more money to get a little more staff so we can get a lot more money, so we can get a lot of staff, so we can get a, a big global movement. Now, here's the good point, Ben. Which movements out there might be good allies to us? Which movements and campaigns are, are, are needing a healthy microbiome? Certainly human health. Certainly regenerative agriculture, certainly carbon drawdown for climate change, because most of the heavy lifting are the soil microbes, certainly all the environmental groups, including the oceans, even the indigenous people who think GMO means God move over, they are on our side. Even national defense is freaking out about the availability of CRISPR kits and the ability for some purposeful or random accident. So we have an opportunity to create a movement of movements at a time just after microbes wreaked havoc on the world population and economy. So the receptor cells of the planet are open just at this time when we need to lock down GM microbes and say, not on our watch. In fact, never should we allow the random release of GM microbes in the environment knowing what we know about the nature of microbes, the nature of microbiomes, their support of ecosystems, and the accidental and unpredictable nature of genetic engineering. So what's the possibility that we could stop letting all these groups and individuals have their own CRISPR technology? Well, I'm guessing, Ben, that in the last 12 minutes, when I started talking about maybe even eight minutes, when I started talking about the microbes, that nearly everyone who was not distracted by driving in traffic understood what I was talking about. And right. they're, like, they're like, in my day, there was a TV commercial, the Memorex commercial, where someone would listen to Memorex and the hair was going straight back like they were in a windstorm. I could see people after hearing this, they're like, oh my God, <laughs> we're doomed. But the thing is, one of our greatest assets is that it's so easy to explain. It's not as hard as climate change. It's not as hard as, as DDT, glyphosate. It's like microbes are running the universe here. They run our health. You release a microbe, it may change it in ways that are unpredictable. We only know, we don't even know what 99% of the trillion microbes out there are doing. And yet we're going out to make permanent, unrecallable changes. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> right? So that took, a, that took a minute. Right? right. Oh, and here's an example of something that almost took us down. And, and that's if the humans that have this CRISPR technology actually have good intentions. Yes. And, and you know, as we know, human beings would never try to harm each other. Oh, no. Well, fortunately, we're, we're all well-meaning people that are, <laughs> that are ethical. You know, maybe Monsanto made. Anyway, so 
The point is, we need, if we simp we have to go after the governments to make changes. If it's me knocking at the doors of government and it's Monsanto there with its massive lobbyists, I'm not going to get very far. If it's these movement of movements with popular culture, culture supporting and school curriculum enlightening the children and creating an awareness of this, then we get to make a change in human collective consciousness, which is absolutely necessary right now. As a physician, you are most clearly aware that sometimes a very serious diagnosis or prognosis becomes the wake up call that turns into the person's biggest blessing. Correct. This is one of those. This is like, guys, we have now reached that inevitable time in human civilization where we can re irreversibly redirect the streams of evolution for all time, ending biological evolution as we know it. And even a single one of us with a, who goes to high school can make the, 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 the wrong move and cause the cataclysm. So now that we realize that we have that capacity, it means that we have a new responsibility. And that new responsibility means we have a new relationship with nature. We can't just be going side by side saying, yeah, whatever, just continue. We have to be stewards. We have to be protectors. We have to protect it in such a way that becomes a permanent feature of human civilization. That's why I talk about curriculum. So that just like every child reads about you know, pollution and climate change. Now, every child needs to know about that we cannot play with the gene pool in this haphazard way. We have to protect nature. So this is an opportunity to influence collective consciousness. I don't believe that consciousness is linear or local. I think that we've seen times in human history where civilization jumps up, leaps forward with new inputs and a certain number of people getting it. I think it's happening quickly right now. And I think this is an example of something where we need to leap forward. So all of a sudden, you know, in, a, <clears throat> in some short time, people say, oh, remember that time when we were simply allowing anyone with a CRISPR kit to introduce an organism? What, wasn't that silly? We haven't gotten there yet, but that's what we're going for. Yeah, we got to we got to put the genie back in the bottle soon, too. Absolutely. Well, this has been awesome, Jeffrey. Thank you well, so much. Ben, um, I, I'm passionate. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell. <laughs> and I the thing passion. is, I'm also very optimistic. I mean, when I started off on the GMO issue in 1997, no one wanted, actually it was 96, no one wanted to um, talk about the health dangers, none of the NGOs. It wasn't a consumer thing. They were all talking about environment and whatnot, saying, guys, this is really important. And now 48% of the world's population, 51% of America at a minimum, believe that GMO foods are unsafe. We've built a movement. We see the impact. We are enormously successful. And now we have to build a whole new movement. But we can't. We don't have 27 years to wait. Right. So everybody go to... Um What's your website again? It's responsibletechnology.org slash take action. And please make a donation. So sign up, give your, give your name, support the comments to the USDA. That will also put you on our list unless you tell us not to. And we can, we can give you updates and more information, ways that you can support us and by getting the word out, giving you more knowledge, et cetera. And then please make a donation, ideally recurring, so we know it's coming each month. So that gives us the confidence to say, OK, we have a budget to this and this and this. We were able to get by with so much less money when it was a consumer education campaign. But now we have to change governments, create international treaties, national laws, and that's expensive. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. You're welcome, Ben. Safe eating. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have some openings for new patients so I can see you for a functional medicine consultation for specific health issues like 
gut problems, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen or and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way. Um, and that usually means we're going to do um, some more detailed lab work, stool testing, sometimes urine testing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, a lot more details to get a a better picture of your overall health from a preventative functional medicine perspective. So if you're interested, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 310-395-3111 and we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. I'll talk to everybody next week.